Hey, it's Mark Bergen from the Browns Nation Station. The listeners of the Browns Nation Station can show their Browns Nation pride by going to brownsnationswag.com. The site has all the latest and best fan gear to represent your team. Again, that's brownsnationswag.com. If you're watching the Browns Nation Station on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe to the show so you never miss another episode. All right, cue the music. It's time to start the show. Welcome to the Browns Nation Station. I'm your host, Mark Bergen, joined by my fellow BrownsNation.com writers, Pat Opperman and Stephen Kibitza. Fellas, it's been about a month since we last spoke, and that was before the start of free agency. It's good to see your faces. How are you both you doing tonight? Good, good. No J-H-A-Y, oh, but <laughs> happy to be back. Yeah, swing and a miss. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we were the only ones. I don't, I don't think anyone saw him going to Arizona, but on tonight's episode, we're going to talk about what the Browns need to do to find some help opposite Miles Garrett, that edge pass rusher defensive end position that they'll probably fill through the NFL draft. But first, we're going to discuss the Browns moves that they've made in free agency. And I want to open this up of all the moves that the Browns have made and Pat, I want to start with you. What do you think the best Browns offseason signing has been thus far? Well, I think the, the best is the one that set the tone. They went out and got the best uh, defensive free agent available in John Johnson III. And, um, you know, it's one of those guys that, that um, he was on a team with a lot of big names around him, and he was basically toiling in obscurity there in Los Angeles Rams. But when he left – almost all the other players on the Rams said he was the guy. He was the one that put all the other pieces in place and made sure that all those parts moved well. So, you know, you had bigger names that made the you know, Pro Bowl and stuff. But um, to a man, the Rams and the Rams fans and the Rams coaches are saying that uh, they're going to miss him an awful lot. He shows up here with uh, not just the, the skill set for the field. I mean, he's ranked, uh, you know, among the top safeties in the league. Um, but uh, but also he gives another presence. He, he the reason Sandejo was on the field so much last year, even though he wasn't doing so well, was because he was the brains of the outfit. And they needed a place to you know, not just get a safe, but they had to be brains of the outfit too. And they did that with Johnson. He was the green dot in LA. He'll do the same thing here in Cleveland, um, putting everybody where they need to be. And while providing an up, upgrade, obviously, on the actual play, which, you know, it's a little hard, but hey. Steven, hop in here. Yeah, sorry. Our connection, our connection's a little uh, crazy on the first uh, first one back, but <laughs> so I'm catching some stuff late. But uh, to not, I mean, I think the John Johnson signing is the obvious one, so I won't copy Pat's answer for the best signing of the offseason. But I think the one that I'm uh, not most excited about, but was excited about for the potentials, the Tack McKinley signing. I think anytime you can kind of take, uh, you know, someone a team saw as a top pick at some point in time and bring him into a system, which sounds crazy to say that the Brown system, you know, is like a Super Bowl contending um, system and organization now. (laughs) So I like the concept of bringing in that top, you know, low risk, low pay, but high ceiling talent like McKinley. I mean, as soon as he's working alongside Miles Garrett in that defense, I feel like maybe there'll be some more motivation as opposed to maybe when they were, you know, in Atlanta, just, going through the motions, kind of have a weird transition phase with that team. Yeah, I want to piggyback off what Pat was saying about John Johnson and wearing the green dot. So on the back end, handling communications for that Rams secondary, a very prestigious honor because it's not just that he's doing that for any team, but for as dominant as the Rams were defensively a season ago, fewest total yards allowed of offense from a defensive standpoint and the fewest points per game. And that starts, yeah, that starts with Aaron Donald up front. And that's something I have my eye on this season is, or, you know, is John Johnson, is Troy Hill, is Leonard Floyd, who signed a massive extension with the Rams, are all of those byproducts of Aaron Donald's dominant play from the defensive uh, standpoint at the line of scrimmage? Are they byproducts of him? Or do they actually complement Aaron Donald? Are we giving Aaron Donald a little bit too much credit? But Considering he had that green dot, he's also the team captain for the Rams. And again, this was one of the most dominant defensive units. Not to mention, while his stats on paper might not look that great, his PFF grade, the third best safety in the entire league, and the Browns get him on a pretty good contract. 
shoring up that back end of the secondary. I know Andrew Sandejo takes his lumps in the Browns secondary, and I know he was starting in place of an injured Grant Delpit. I know Greedy Williams missed all of last season with the shoulder injury, but the Browns make definite upgrades with the signing of John Johnson and Troy Hill as well. So getting two key playmakers for a Rams defense last year that was best in the league, that's only going to help the Browns defense in 2021. One thing quick too, you're talking about stats. I know I have uh, Johnson stats pulled up now. And a lot of times when uh, this happens all the time on social media or even talk radio, when there's a signing, people really focus in on the stats. But like you said, you have to go off the grades and you can't go off like safety interception numbers or, you know, anything like that. I mean, he consistently has, I mean, he had over a hundred tackles twice. But Sandejo could have over 100 tackles. You know, what does it mean? So you really have to look into the grades, like you said, and, you know, trust in it. And um, I think there's – it's like the obvious top signing. And the fact that he wanted to sign here is just very exciting. You know, stats aside, just everything you guys mentioned. I was amazed he got 100 opportunities to make a tackle on that defense. I mean, he's played behind the 10 other guys, including some pretty big names. Who got past those guys 100 times? to let you know the free safety exactly. land 100 tackles you know? obviously he's all over the field and um you know good head for the ball and and went after it and uh that's that's gonna be very good for the uh the browns of course and as far as aaron donald goes i mean not for nothing let's see if aaron donald gets what he has i mean aaron donald got an extra second every play last year to get a sack to get to the quarterback because he had such an excellent defensive backfield and mm-hmm. i think that's what's going to see in in um in cleveland you've got between uh, Johnson at the free safety, you got uh, Greedy Williams and um, Ward, who are like, you know, locked down safety, supposedly by reputation on the outside. You add Troy Hill in the middle. And uh, I'm just thinking if you have a chance to bet the over or under on sacks for the uh, Cleveland Browns this year, you got to go with the over because that defensive backfield is going to buy them a lot of coverage sacks. I like how we're talking about playing complimentary football from the defensive standpoint, not relying on Miles Garrett to continually bail this team out with his dominance at the line of scrimmage. And really, I think that's where all that starts, but I do think it'll make, you know, you could get to the quarterback with four because you have a secondary that's reliable. And I'm excited to see that now that you have some depth in the secondary, what does that do for Greedy Williams? Who's going to be fighting for a starting position? What does that do for Grant Delpit, who is going to start as a rookie, the Jim Thorpe award winner at LSU, once he gets back healthy from his season ending injury a season ago. So I think the competition is going to help on the back end. I also think you have depth. If you do have an injury at any of those positions, all right, it's next man up and you have someone reliable in each of those positions, whether it's the cornerback or the safety position. Yep. Yeah. It's yeah, I agree. I think that oh, yeah. I'll go for it, Pat. We're probably yeah. going to have the same. <laughs> same point here where it's just all, okay. it's just all sounds great. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, I mean, the numbers are stacking up. Well, they, they added some numbers at linebacker and, and now uh, amazingly the weakness of the team might be the defensive line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what will lead us to the NFL draft. And do we want to get into clowny now, Pat, or do you want to, I mean, cause that's really kind of the, that's the elephant in the room right now. Yeah, I, I, you know, obviously they're not done. I mean, the Tack McKinley, I, I agree that Tack McKinley has the highest upside of all the players here. Um, not that he will be the best of the signings, but uh, compared to what we expect, he might be the best uh, surprise, the biggest surprise. Um, you know, McKinley admits that he was immature and he was, uh, he had off field issues that he was not handling well. And he brought his off field issues into the locker room and it affected his play. And he was kind of rude and nasty and stuff. Um, and, you know, and he made a mistake with the demanding the trade and everything. And he was basically, you know, when he was with Dan Quinn, Dan Quinn went out of his way to say that he thought Tack McKinley still has a breakout year coming. And he expects it to be this year in Cleveland, which is great. Um, his other coach uh, was uh, Raheem Morris. By the time he, by the time McKinley asked for the trade publicly or complained on Twitter or whatever he did, Raheem Morris was already the interim for a reason because Dan Quinn couldn't get the defense together. So there, there was a lot of, moving parts. The coaching staff wasn't great. Uh, McKinley wasn't handling his own stuff well. And uh, Raheem Morris didn't want any part of it. He just basically said, cut, you know, you're out, you know, take, take a hike. 
And um, but McKinley's saying all the right things. Uh, he knows that Andrew Berry, not only did he try to get him off waivers three times last year, but the year before that, he offered a trade. He, he was willing to trade a, a draft pick for him. So um, this is the fifth time, you know, fifth time's a charm, McKinley said, that uh, Andrew Berry got him. And he's putting his reputation on the line. You know, Andrew Berry, you know, supposed to be the best, uh, one of the best talent evaluating GMs. And, um, you know, and now he's putting all his marbles on McKinley right now. Maybe that's why he doesn't get clowny or anybody. So uh, we'll see what happens if, if his reputation takes a shot because McKinley fails or if McKinley comes around. But even with McKinley there, they need another body to, to add on. They, they just, even the numbers are not good on the defensive line. There's just not a lot of depth. And, um, you know, Miles Garrett, I was glad to see him playing basketball and, and uh, lifting weights and stuff. Apparently he has recovered from his COVID thing. He's able to breathe and everything, which is great. Um, and McKinley's going to be full gun and you got Fort Augustine and with full, you know, full head of steam, but, um, but I don't know if it's going to be enough. I think you need another body, whether through the draft or, or if they can get Clowney and that, that brings it back to Clowney. I think I'm, I, I, I might be ahead, the tiebreaker, Steve. Mark, really quick. I think if I'm correct that uh, Pat's fine with Clowney and you don't want him, if I'm correct. Yeah, we can go into that. We can go into this if you we can go into this if you want. And I can sure. make my case and Pat, you can make yours if you want. With Clowney, I think sure, he's sure. definitely better as a Robin than a Batman. So I think he would be better paired opposite Miles Garrett. Miles Garrett being Batman, he plays the Robin role. But to me, Jadavion Clowney was playing at his best at an NFL level, paired opposite a healthy J.J. Watt when he went to three Pro Bowls. The problem is, is he hasn't been able to stay on the field. So, Pat, you mentioned, okay, well, maybe that's where the role McKinley would play as a backup or someone who could spell either Garrett or Clowney if you were to sign him. It, to me, it really depends on what kind of salary he's going to garner. But if you're going to pay someone $12 million, the best ability is availability. And Clowney's coming off a torn meniscus injury. He didn't have any sacks last season in eight games for the Titans. That was a complete mess. A Titans team that only had 19 sacks on the season. Clowney got hurt. They cut Vic Beasley, who was their other big offseason signing. Now, I know if you look at the grades, Clowney was the 19th best pass rusher in the league when he did play. But I just don't think you're getting enough value for a player who has struggled to say, stay healthy, hasn't played a full 16 game season since 2017. So for those reasons, I think the Browns would be better suited to get someone in the NFL draft, whether it's with the 26 overall pick in the first round or someone in the second round that they could pair opposite miles Garrett. And I'm still high on the upside of McKinley because, you know, the player I kind of would compare him to would be what the Bucks just did with Shaq Barrett. A few seasons ago, they get Shaq Barrett for $5 million. The Browns are bringing in McKinley on a one-year deal worth $4 million. That's like the ceiling you have for attack McKinley for this upcoming season. But I just don't think with Clowney, the number he's going to want something north of $10 million. I don't think it's worth it because he hasn't stayed healthy and he's not that same dude who absolutely knocked out the Michigan running back in the Outback Bowl all of those seasons ago when he was still playing at South Carolina. Well, here's the deal with Clowney. Clowney, you know, to put a, a person like Clowney opposite Miles Garrett is not so much be, to get more out of Clowney. It's to get more out of Garrett. We're trying to get some relief off the double teams on the opposite side. So we need somebody with the reputation to get in there. Clowney is the reason why Clowney is not signed anywhere yet is because he's not going to get 10 million to 12 million dollars. There's just no way in hell it's going to happen. He's going to get a seven and a half to eight million dollar contract with, with incentives that can bring him to 12, 13, 14. So if you get a pro bowler, you pay him for it. If you don't get a pro bowler, you don't. That's why he hasn't signed. And I think what I, I'm not sure who is behind, like if, if he wants to wait, because he's playing very close to the vest. We know at least five teams are looking at him, but he won't sign anywhere. And I, my theory is that he's waiting for the draft. And just say with Cleveland, as an example, if Cleveland goes down and gets a, a, a quiety pay or whatever his name, you know, somebody like that, they trade up and get one of the top edge guys. Well, forget Clowney. We don't need him. But if we don't, if we strike out and we can't trade up, if we end up getting, um, you know, a, a third or fourth round guy that we need to develop, Clowney might be holding out, hoping somebody will throw another million into the fox. He's not getting the money he wants. That, that's really what the issue is with Clowney. If Clowney got a $12 million deal right now, he'd be signed by anybody. 
Um, so I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to have to take a one-year prove-it deal, stay on the field. I'm not worried about his meniscus. I'm worried about the 20 other injuries he had before that. Uh, you know, feet, knees, back, all the important parts there, you know. But it's not unheard of for a 29, 30-year-old to, to bounce back from a bunch of injuries and, and have a good season. So he's, he's worth it on a, a one-year prove-it deal with a lot of incentives um, if he's willing to take it. Uh, if not, though, I, I think you're going to see, you know, th there's a few other old guys out there that we could sign for a year. But um, I, I think once you get past Clowney, it's, it's a draft pick. That, that's your two choices. Yeah, Pat, I'm with you that I think the Browns need someone other than just McKinley there. I just don't think Clowney's the answer. And I think there's going to be a team that caves last minute. He didn't sign with the Titans last year until September. Now, I know we're coming off the COVID season. We've seen so many one-year deals because the salary cap is less than the $182.5 million, which is lower than it was a season ago. So you're seeing the financial impact of the pandemic impacts this upcoming season. Again, that's the reason why you're seeing a lot of shorter term deals. It will be a one year prove it deal. But I think that once we go through training camp, we have the three preseason games. I think there's going to be a team that panics, decides to give Clowney the money he's seeking, whether that's Cleveland or not, that remains to be seen. But I think there's always going to be a need for a pass rusher. And the team still think that they're getting that guy from South Carolina, who is going to be this high and mighty second coming of Reggie White. And the fact of the matter is he's not had a double digit sack season in his NFL career. Again, he's a Robin, not a Batman from an edge rushing standpoint. And yeah, he'd be pretty good paired opposite miles Garrett. I don't trust his ability to stay healthy. And that's why just in my opinion, I think the Browns should stay away. I think I, I can be the tiebreaker here. I think uh, not to be like a first take host. <laughs> no, no, this uh, is but, great. Uh, but I, I do opt with what Pat's been saying. I mean, I I look at it differently, you know, than you, Mark, just because I think this season's going to be one of the most unique in like recent NFL history based on the fact that a lot of guys are going to take those one-year deals and you just have guys all over the league and the roster is going to look very different in 2022 just based on the salary cap being lowered. I mean, it's, we're already seeing it happen. Um, but I think – like Pat said, there's no, I don't think a team's going to cave and pay him. I mean, last year he was asking what, like 15, some million from the Browns. And they're like, he got offered. No. yeah, true. So now he plays right. eight games in Tennessee. Um, I think maybe by the time summer rolls around, they can convince him that, Hey, did you take this seven or $8 million deal? If we win the super bowl, we'll pay you double. Who cares? Like just, <laughs> So. <laughs> I, he seems like a guy who at this point in his career, which is becoming a trend, which is fine. I'm fine with only wants to sign with a contender. Like Pat said, he's not coming in to get 10 sacks. He's coming in to help miles Garrett have some all pro season. So I'm fine with it. I don't think Andrew Barry would pay him over $10 million. That would just go against everything. I think the front office believes in. So unless I mean, sports are crazy. Maybe some team gives them $14 million just because they, which would be insane this season with the salary cap. But I think if they can get him on the, his actual market value, I'm fine with it. You know, if they have some sort of rotation at the other end spot, I see no problem with that. He is still a threat because of his name and size. He's going to open everything up for Garrett. The rest of the defense is just going to improve. If he, if he's only on the field for, I don't I, I wouldn't even want to say 50% of the snaps last year. He played 38% of the snaps, but only in eight games. If he gets it up to 50 or 60%, maybe it helps. It. I don't know. He gets healthier. He's not out there so much. I don't know. I like it just from the fact that he can improve Garrett on a one year. Let's try to win a Super Bowl basis before they have to pay Baker. Steven, I think you do bring up yeah, a great point it. about we that don't... figure. I think you bring up a great point about the figure of that it ultimately coming down to that. I just think he's too big of a name not to garner north of 10, closer to 15 million. Yeah, I could Pat, what I want, Pat, what I want to ask you is if the Browns do bring in Clowney, what do you want them to do with the 26 overall pick then? Uh, if they bring Clowney and it's best, it's the best athlete available. I mean, that, that turns off. Okay. Pets. If they don't bring Clowney and they almost have to get an edge rusher mm -hmm. or possibly if Zayvon Collins falls down because he can probably provide a rush from the linebacker position too. Um, 
But I think it'll be, if they get Clowney, it'll be best athlete available, no doubt about it. It could be a cornerback. This draft, at the point that we're drafting, I mean, not to get into drafts now, that's another podcast, but uh, there's going to be so many quarterbacks taken and um, a few edge guys and stuff. It's really hard to predict what's or who's going to be available at 26. And then the question will be, because we have a pretty full roster right now, would he trade up? to get a guy he needs. If he doesn't get Clowney, would he trade up to get a Rousseau or, or a Pei or, or uh, Owe or somebody like that? So, I mean, that, that's going to be an interesting, uh, the draft show, you know, not to plug the draft show, our next podcast will be great. But, um, but you know, not to get into that, but I think it's Clowney. Uh, you know, I remember too, you know, you make a big thing about, um, you know, Leverett makes a big thing about the, uh, the sacks, but we don't need him to get 20 sacks, okay? What we need is somebody that can hold up that end so that when the quarterback tries to escape from Garrett, that end is shut down, okay? My concern about McKinley is McKinley's a speed rusher. He wants to go outside and go around, which leaves that kind of open and puts it on the tackle, um, but, you know, which we haven't talked about yet, the defensive tackles. But, um, you know, so I, that's why I like Clowney. I think Clowney stops a run. He, he, he shuts down. that. He, he creates a wall, which is what we need so that the quarterback can't escape from – from uh, Miles Garrett. I, I am looking forward to Tack McKinley's media availabilities just because he's been pretty colorful when he was, you know, before he came to the Browns. I can't wait to see how he interacts with the media members throughout Cleveland. Yeah. Let's move on to what do you guys think the most underrated signing the Browns have made this offseason? Let's go to that. And uh, Stephen, we'll start with you. Yeah, I. I'm trying to think of underrated because initially I thought that getting Richard Higgins back on a very small money deal wasn't necessarily underrated, but it was a kind of a surprising move to me that, well, I guess from a national standpoint, I will, I'll go with it as my underrated because he's not talked about that much outside of Cleveland. I'm just used to talking about him watching, you know, watching every Browns game. But when, when you looked at his projections, on different, you know, websites, he was projected to get potentially 6 million annually in some spots. And I was like, there's no way that's going to happen. But, you know, they do the player comps of people with his similar age and everything like that. But obviously his situation is a little more unique, but I try not to dive too much into him and Baker's relationship because ultimately what matters is the numbers on the field. I don't really care if they get along well. They just need to, you know, combine for some actual touchdowns, you know, and stuff and not just hype. But I think getting them back on that very, very small deal, I believe worth just over $2 million um, is a huge win. And it's something that Browns fans go, okay, you know, we're getting Higgins back. But nationally, if you look at their list of signings, few people are going to say, oh, they got Higgins. That's amazing. But to me, I go, okay, we're keeping the wide receiving core intact. Maybe this is the last year all three top guys are here. Just some consistency and it's underrated in the sense where it's not a flashy signing of someone who's a pro bowler, but it just keeps the offense intact for the first time since in a very long time. I don't know. I kind of thought the uh, Higgins, not to be controversial. I love Rashard Higgins. Okay. Uh, there's I a butt coming. <laughs> I'm very happy he's back. And the guy really wanted to be back and we wanted him back but it is probably the most overrated in Cleveland signing. Okay. Uh, everywhere else in the league is like a big deal. <laughs> Richard Higgins, you know, he came through last year. I love the guy. It was fantastic. He was Odell Beckham last year, but this year we have Odell Beckham again, we hope. And Rashard Higgins is going to be the fifth option at best. Okay. He's going to be behind Jarvis, going to be behind Beckham. He's going to be behind Hooper. He's going to be behind a Joko or the second tight end, whoever that is. He might be behind a third tight end. He might be behind Kareem Hunt. What is this guy going to do this year? So, I mean, for, for us, the price was right for that kind of receiver, a great uh, escape route. The guy will have some big plays because you know, you know, he's going to put a play in there for him once in a while. And uh, he'll probably have some big moments, but it was more of a spiritual uplifting type of deal, you know, enhance the locker room atmosphere. Everybody loves the guy. Let's keep the family together type of signing. Um, he might have gotten more elsewhere. Uh, I follow a few other teams too. Houston, uh, he was like second or third on the list for Houston after they didn't get their top guy. He probably could have gotten about $4 million out of Houston uh, to be a starter. 
okay? But, uh, but that $6 million was based on a starting number two wide receiver on some other team. He was never going to get that from us. And I, I thought he might actually squeeze three or four out of um, Barry before he re-signed Catterell Hodge. When he re-signed Hodge, I thought Higgins was out. I figured that was it. They're not going to sign both of them back. And I was kind of surprised. We have seven or eight wide receivers on the roster now, even though a couple of them are just return specialists. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in, uh, in training camp. But I, I think Higgins, I mean, I love it. I'm glad he's there. He should be on the roster. But as far as, like, you know, making the offense better, I don't think he's going to play that big a role next year. I like having Baker Mayfield safety blanket, security blanket back <laughs> on this roster because, to me, it provides insurance to where – OBJ has to be on his best behavior. And he was before he got hurt last season. But if OBJ doesn't produce, like, look at the catch percentage numbers for whatever reason. I, I don't want to, you know, look too much into this relationship with Baker Mayfield, but they always say that the sideline tells the story. And what was the game last year where Higgins scores a touchdown and Mayfield comes sprinting in and does like a somersault into the end zone? I don't see Baker doing that with OBJ. So if OBJ doesn't perform, you could say, hey, OBJ, if you're not playing up to your contract, we have a guy who, yeah, he's only making $2.3 million. We know who can get the job done. And he proved that last season. To have him back on this cheap of a deal and a guy who wants to be here and wants to be a Cleveland Brown, I love this signing. I absolutely love this signing. Whether he plays that big of a role, it's the insurance because we know what he can do. I know the upside's not quite nearly as, he's not the same level as OBJ. OBJ's a tremendous athlete, but for one reason or another, it hasn't worked out for OBJ in a Browns uniform through two seasons. We'll see if that can happen ah, but, in year three. But let me, let me hit you with this uh, number here, okay? okay? There's another receiver on the Cleveland Browns who has almost the exact same catch percentage in his first two years with Baker Mayfield as Odell Beckham. And that is Jarvis Landry. Identical. If Odell Beckham caught three more passes in his first two years, he would have the exact same catch percentage and an extra yard and a half per catch over Jarvis Landry. Okay. This is, you know, not as big a deal. Landry, his catch percentage went way up last year because they changed his role. He went back to more of his Miami Dolphins uh, route. He went to shorter routes and more targets and, you know, picked up, you know, uh, his game that way. But, um, but OBJ is going to come back in the Stefan Diggs role, per se. And uh, so, yeah, he's going to have a lower percentage because his passes are going to be deeper. But, uh, but I think that, um, you know, once Stefanski decides he's going to find the role for somebody and make it work, He'll fix OBJ. I have no doubt that OBJ is going to come back and be okay if he stays healthy. And I mean, that's why I like the Higgins signing as an insurance policy. But you know, that's that's about it. And um, you know, but I think OBJ is getting a bum rap here. I, I, you know, again, that wasn't OBJ that was yelling at the coaches on the sideline. That wasn't OBJ calling the coach a jerk. That was Landry and Mayfield and everybody else who were saying was such a rah rah Browns guys. OBJ is. What has he done that is upsetting people in Cleveland that make him think he doesn't want to be here? You know, I don't understand that, that, that whole thing. I agree with that. I'm people who hate on OBJ. It makes no sense. I guess I look at the Higgins thing. Like you're filling out the roster, you get them for $2 million. Why not? But I understand it is, it is a very Browns fan thing to latch on to one of the last options on offense. It's, it's not new. It happens all the time. It's like falling in love with the third string running back. It's just, it's just, and now that they're better, maybe, you know, the season starts and we go, okay, just trade Higgins or whatever. It's just, you know, he's not getting any targets, but for now being in that mindset, that's where, I, where I'm coming from there. I think, yeah, well, it may end up being the, uh, the most important role of Higgins is that if we get to the um, trade deadline, and we have a big need and it looks like we're not going to have be able to afford both the receivers next year. Yeah you know there's going to be OBJ trade rumors right through the oh, yeah. <laughs> of there. So having Higgins in the background will help us uh, sell that, that we really can trade him and, and still be okay. So uh, speaking of important, you know, the other side of the ball too, we kind of skipped over all the other free agent signs, uh, like the linebacker. I mean, Anthony Walker, uh, that may be you know, one of the more important. Walker basically is B.J. Gooden, a couple of years younger. And um, – you know, he's, again, he's, he's very uh, high character uh, leader type of guy. Um, 
he will uh, help those younger guys, you know, really learn how to get better. Um, you know, our, our three guys. And, um, but again, he has the same weakness. He doesn't cover very well out of the, out of the linebacker position. So it, it's pretty much, it is BJ good. And now, now Goodson uh, surprised us last year. He covered a little bit better. That may have been the product of coaching. It may have been the product of using the defensive backs to cover. Grant Delpit, one of his strongest suits was covering a tight end. Um, so, you know, the linebacker might be relieved of that duty, you know, they might be able to work out something there to cover up that deficiency, but overall Walker is a bang up guy. He's, he's the leader of that, that, that middle group. And, um, along with, I really like the fact they brought Malcolm Smith back too. that. I think the two of them will uh, bring some good stability and leadership and, and, uh, solid effort from the linebacker position, even if it isn't the most important in Joe Wood's scheme. Yeah. The Smith signing to me was another sort of no brainer. Um, I mean, I don't think he did anything necessarily bad that wouldn't warrant him coming back, but I mean, a lot of times he gets billed as that, you know, every, every time they talk about him, they're saying, Oh, former Super Bowl MVP, Super Bowl MVP. It's like, all we need him to do is just provide solid, you know, stability and from the linebacking position. It was just crazy to me that a team can, you know, for so long, ignore that. And this year, finally, doing that, like you said, kind of get a Goodson upgrade, which is a nice change. So, I mean, I, no one wants to listen to the show where everyone agrees to each other with each other, but Pat, I, I mean, I guess I have nothing more to add. I, it's just, I haven't seen anything negative really from any of their signings. Yeah. Another well, Andrew Barry off season has been, you know, how adults would handle it. Now I do think the linebacker position could be an area where the Browns look to make upgrades in the draft, depending on who's available when they pick. We'll see about that. But is this the portion of the show where we bring up the Cody Parkey re-signing pad? I know this is a signing that you actually like. The most important signing of the year was Cody Parkey. Oh, uh, so, oh no. You know, bring it back <laughs> to kicker. I just felt that. Was I got harassed about Higgins. <laughs> It was a no-brainer. <laughs> if you look at the available stickers that were out there, um, there was a couple of big names, mostly older guys. Uh, Parkey was right up there with all of them. The only one that might have excited Mark a little bit more was um, the guy from Detroit, um, Prater, Matt Prater, ended up going to Arizona. Um, you know, he had a bigger leg, and I know you love those 50-yard field goals, but, um, but we're not sure how that big leg would translate, you know, on a leg front as opposed to in a dome. So we're not really sure how that would have gone. And we still don't know that Kevin Stefanski is willing to ever try a 50-yard field goal. He'd rather run the ball. So um, so I think they're okay with Parkey. Uh, that said, this other guy, uh, they have another kicker on the um, roster already, uh, McCain or McCrane, something like that. And, um, you know, he beat the – he's another player who beat the Browns once before, before they came to join us. Uh, he kicked a game when he field goal for Oakland back in 18 against the Browns. But, um, you know, it's a kicker. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Um, I like how the 50 yard field goal to you is more of an indictment on Stefanski than it is Cody Parkey. That cracks me up, Pat. <laughs> you are a Parkey truther, but he did, he has done well in Cleveland. <laughs> people do, people hate on every kicker, but he's, I mean, p- people talk about how great Justin Tucker is, but he was missing field goals last year. So it's true. That's Cody, true. Cody Parkey is the career 80% kicker from 50 yards or longer. He's eight out of 10 in his career. I'm He's going to miss say- three in week one and we're going to have to re-record. <laughs> and I'm just, yeah. And I'm just saying towards the end of last season, the way it was trending. And I know it's unfair to take only a three game sample size, but when he had three games in a row where he had missed an extra point, I can say this having watched the Browns games. And this is just Brown. I know Browns fans felt this way because they've seen Cody Parkey in the double doink game and his struggles in Chicago a few seasons back. But no one wanted to see Parkey have to attempt a, a game tying or a game oh, yeah. winning field goal or extra point when it came down the stretch towards the back half of the season for the Browns last season. I'm telling I you think, this. Lesson, I'm telling you as having seen it before. <laughs> I agree. And, and I, I don't want to see another today show appearance for Cody Parkey when he misses a <laughs> huge field goal. I don't want to live in that world. Yeah, to be fair, Listen, Parkey. Well, Parky did tank the entire Bears franchise. If it's fourth and one from the 25, we go for it. Fourth and one from the 40, we let him kick. That's the way it works. 
<laughs> yeah. We'll see. And I do understand what you're saying, though, about, you know, you don't know what you're going to get from another kicker or if you were to bring in a rookie kicker, too. We'll see. But I, again, I mean, if the season comes down to Cody Parkey's leg, I am I'm on record watching. as Park, saying Park. I don't Park. trust it. Historically speaking, if you want to get rid of Parky, let him be the opening day kicker. How often do they last That's the season. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I will say, Pat, I openly told my family when we were watching the Chiefs game. I said, if this comes down to a Parky kick, I'm going outside. He's gonna miss it. I watched him. <laughs> I watched him ruin the entire Chicago Bears franchise in three seconds. Ruined Mitch Trubisky's career. I know it's gonna. <laughs> I know it's gonna happen again. I'm just waiting for it to happen. <laughs> Fellas, we'll start to wrap up here on the Browns Nation station, and it's been a great there is, There's one other signing, too. That... Go ahead, Pat. Sorry, Pat, go ahead. I was saying there's one other signing we never mentioned, too, on defense. That is another signing that looks like it might be a, an Andrew Berry special is Malik Jackson. Yeah. Okay. So we grabbed uh, you know 10-year veteran Malik Jackson um, after a couple of down years. And um, if he works out, you know, he got a pretty good amount of money. He got four and a half million dollars, which is a million more than Andrew Billings is getting to come back from the COVID list. So, um, but I mean, Malik Jackson, he had an awful couple of years in Philly. I mean, he did get, he did get a decent number of pressures. So it wasn't as bad as it looked in Philadelphia, but he didn't play hardly, you know, most of the season. And um, he missed the entire season before that. And the season before that, Jacksonville benched him for performance. So, you know, it's really three years kind of, you know, non Malik Jackson like and, and we're making it out to see that he's going to be the answer at defensive tackle with Billings. I'm not sure how that's going to work out. Uh between Billings coming back from COVID and um you know being off for the year, he's going to be rusty or is he going to be refreshed? We don't know. And Malik Jackson coming off, you know, three kind of subpar years in a row. Um we've got basically uh Sheldon Richardson and we got Elliot who you know showed promise but you know, he had no tackles for a loss, no sacks, no quarterback, or nothing, nothing statistically. And then we have the two big question marks, Billings and um, Lee Jackson. I, I think that in the draft, I think that's an area that second, third, fourth round, even fifth round, uh, you'll probably see a body or two added to that mix because that's a, that's a very shallow position as it is. And half of it has got big question marks after their name. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point, Pat, in how the Browns decide to draft – if they decide to bring anyone else in in free agency, but then you also are facing that deadline for the fifth year extension for both Baker Mayfield and Denzel Ward, if you're going to pick that up. So, you know, some moving pieces and you still do have some salary cap space to fill those holes on the roster, but it's going to be interesting to see if the Browns decide to do that with whoever's left in free agency or who they're going to decide to bring in as rookies through the draft. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't sign anybody else in free agency until after the draft and they start seeing how it settles down for two reasons. One, obviously, we'll see who we have in the draft. And also because the price tags come down significantly mm -hmm. when veterans start panicking, they might have to sit out a season or end their careers. Um, but, you know, we keep talking about the fifth year options and, and that's important, but at least those prices are fixed. Uh, Nick Chubb doesn't get a, a fifth year option. We have to yeah. resign him. He's a free agent in 2022. So that's a contract we got to work on. And Kareem Hunt's a free agent too. So there's other guys. There's a few others. Uh, Sheldon Richardson. You know, do we let him go? We bring him back. He's going to be 31, and he'll be a free agent next year. Um, so yeah, when it comes to cost, you know, and that that's why there's no way they're going to pay Clowney 14, 15, or you know, you know, he should have took the three years at 57 million he got yeah. offered last year. That's a, you know, <laughs> that's an expensive lesson for him. But um, but yeah, there, there's you know there's a lot of priorities other than this. That's why I think they'll wait. We'll get some last minute guys and, and, um, uh, and we'll see how it goes. Let me lay out a roadmap for the listeners for what's ahead in the coming week. So first round of the draft gets underway on April the 29th, and then we'll go the next two days. So first round in Cleveland on April 29th, certainly very exciting. And then that fifth year option deadline for both Mayfield and Ward is May the 3rd. You mentioned Nick Chubb. That's really going to be a huge discussion this upcoming season, how Nick Chubb performs in a contract season. And we mentioned finding the right dollar figure. Think of all of the struggles of the running backs who have gotten big contracts 
to where it doesn't work out. And so I know Nick Chubb is beloved in Cleveland, but you've got to find a dollar amount that works for both parties to where you're not overpaying Nick Chubb. And it really doesn't have more so to do about Nick Chubb as it does to how the running back position is valued in the NFL. And so those are really kind of the big things looking ahead of what's going to be an exciting finish to the off season. I cannot wait for the draft here at the end of the month. Yeah. The, the Chubb thing. That's why I'm so um, I guess my main theme of the whole off season, I'm very happy that they're taking these one year deals and trying to really go all in this year. You know, it is unique because of the salary cap, but I mean, once you start paying a quarterback, that's like the, the dream of a rebuilding team is win a Super Bowl with a quarterback who's not on his max contract yet. And there, this is the last you know, year before the negotiations really go nuts. So, you know, they had the rebuilding years where they got several first round picks every year and now they're trying to win with them. Um, I mean, it's, you know, saying it's Super Bowl or bust is insane because it's the Browns. But this is the year really where they want to go all in and um you know try to win because it's gonna it's gonna get very tricky starting in 2022 and you're not gonna be able to have you know just sign anyone you want like the browns have been able to do for so long yeah i think it's, it's kind of a weird season um for cleveland i think you know when you look at their free agent signings you know johnson uh, troy hill mckinley they're all young guys uh and then you have the one-year deal for Malik, you know, because he's older. And um, I, I think one of the reasons why I thought they might really go heavy after um, Clowney uh, is because even though they have a long-term plan and they will be competitive for a long time, there is a risk between, you know, you got Chubb as a free agent, you got uh, Hunt as a free agent, you got Sheldon Richards as a free agent. You still got two $16 million a year wide receivers that maybe you can't afford. This team could look radically different in 2022, not because Barry wanted to, but because these guys might walk. Yeah. You know, some of them. And um, and so, yeah, I think this is a, uh, you know, you hate to say, you know, Super Bowl or bust because we'll still be in it for a few years. we got some good young talent going ahead, but it's going to be different and a little more difficult after this season, um, which is, and, and we have the advantage of having had a few more dollars than some of the other teams. So it is kind of a, a weird thing. I think the draft is going to be very telling as far as their plans for next year. And, um, and yeah, I, I don't know how else to explain it. <laughs> yeah. And just to piggyback off that, as we wrap up here, can you build off what was a successful year one with Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski and company to where you have that continuity now that you haven't had with this franchise for so many years. So can you build on that with the stability that is in place? Do it again, prove it in year two. And that's certainly what's ahead. And so Guys, this is always a lot of fun to talk with both of you. What, again, has been a very, very exciting offseason. And again, we've got the draft coming up on April 29th. I'd imagine we'll talk again as it gets closer to the draft, probably a few days before the draft, just because you know, a lot of teams will make trades. But uh, certainly always great talking with you here on the Browns Nation Station. Yeah, happy to talk positive Browns news. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely a cheerier uh, conversation to have than years past, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for Pat Opperman and Stephen Kibitzka, I'm Mark Bergen. Thank you for listening to the Browns Nation Station. Go give us a five-star review. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. Take care. We'll see you here in a few weeks. So long, everybody.